Greetings and welcome to Train Signal. You're watching Plan, Install, Configure, and Manage Transport. It's a primary section for the 70-341 exam revolving around Exchange 2013 core services. The subtopic for this lesson is Configure and Manage Hygiene. So under the subject Configure and Manage Hygiene, the objective may include but is not limited to managing content filtering, managing recipient filtering, managing sender ID, managing connection filtering, and managing spam confidence level SCL thresholds. All of this is under the anti-spam settings for Exchange 2013. In addition, the objective may include managing anti-malware. All right, so we see that our main focus here in this lesson will revolve around anti-spam and anti-malware or antivirus protection. And so, let's get started. Looking at this from a scenario perspective, we're going to be working with SpyTech Prime, and they are a vendor for spy technology. Now, they have a problem, and that is logically with their background, they want to ensure spam and virus content doesn't infiltrate their environment. Our goal is going to be first to explain what Exchange does and does not provide so that they're aware, and we'll get their anti-malware and anti-spam up and running. So for starters, let's talk about anti-spam features in Exchange 2013. Anti-spam is enabled on the Edge Transport Server. Now that's an Edge Transport Server running Exchange 2010. And so if you're familiar with Exchange, if you've worked with it in the past, if you worked with 2010, you know that the Edge Transport Server has this enabled by default, and you can configure it through the Exchange Management Console, the GUI, or through the Exchange Management Shell. Now, that's on the Edge side. So if we have an Edge Transport Server for our organization, whether the organization is running Exchange 2010 or 2013, then we can configure anti-spam settings through the GUI on that Edge Transport Server. However, if we're not working with an Edge and our concern is an internal hub transport server running Exchange 2010 or a mailbox server running Exchange 2013, well, anti-spam is not enabled by default. And so if we want to enable the anti-spam agents on these servers, whether it's the hub transport or the mailbox server, what we need to do is run the install dash anti spam agents dot ps1 powershell script and that will enable the agents now when you install anti spam agents on the hub transport server the GUI will adjust that is the exchange management console it adjusts to allow configuration so prior to doing the installation of the agents you don't see a tab for them and then on the hub transport server after you install the agents now there's a tab for anti-spam configuration. So you might be thinking, well that's great, so in 2013 when I install these agents, does the Exchange Admin Center update to allow me to manage it? Well no, it doesn't, unfortunately. And so the only way to manage your anti-spam settings through Exchange 2013 is through the Exchange Management Shell. And so that's a little bit of a frustration, but that's just the way it is. So we're going to talk about some of the different commandlets that you have to type in in order to configure the different settings. But let's first talk about the anti-spam agents and how they work in Exchange 2013. Alright, so we're going to talk about the anti-spam agents and we'll actually talk about them in order of application. In other words, in the order that they apply. So for starters we have sender filtering. You use sender filtering to specify a list of email senders that you want to block completely. So you can block individuals, you can block domains, or whole domain hierarchies. You can also specify how the server will respond when a blocked sender or domain transmits a message. And you can also block messages that do not specify who sent the message. So that would mean no messages with blank senders. So that's the sender filtering feature. Next up we have recipient filtering. So this would be the next part of the anti-spam application process. Now with recipient filtering, this is a simple feature where you can specify a list of email recipients from which the server will not accept messages. So you can block individuals or domains using this feature. 
You can also use recipient filtering to block messages that are sent to recipients that are not listed in the global address list. The next one is sender ID filtering. This is intended to combat email spoofing and to provide enhanced protection against phishing schemes. So you use sender ID to examine a sender's purported responsible address or PRA. If the check fails, you can determine whether you want to reject or delete the message or send it along with a stamped message of sender ID results. And then that is actually something that's utilized by content filtering in order to make up the SCL or spam confidence level. So that's actually the next part of the process. That's content filtering. So you can see how it's important for these other things to come first, especially if in the case of sender ID filtering, the message is going to move forward to content filtering, but now it has this stamped information in that it did not do well when it comes to sender ID if it failed the check. Okay, so content filtering filters junk email by using a probability-based algorithm that can learn what is and what isn't spam. So you use this feature to filter junk email based on the content of the message and you can actually set the filtering threshold actions how content is analyzed, recipient exceptions, and specific words and phrases for the content filtering feature to act upon. So once you configure all of this you also configure the spam confidence level rating thresholds. Now as far as what that is basically you can establish different levels and we'll talk about this in a moment and these levels will actually determine what happens to the message is it deleted is it quarantined so based upon what level comes up after it goes through the content filtering side that determines the future of that message now some of the other things that are used with content filtering include the Outlook Safe Senders list, the Safe Recipients list, and Trusted Contacts. And then in the end it assigns a Spam Confidence Level or SCL. Another anti-spam agent is the Sender Reputation Filtering anti-spam agent. Now this collects information about recent email messages that have been received and if a sender appears to be the source of junk email the address is added to a list. Now, there's some flexibility as to the length of time that a sender can be blocked, and you can also enable or disable open proxy testing in this case. And ultimately, the sender reputation filter will create a sender reputation level, or SRL. And so, that number, if the SRL is a number between 0 and 9, where 0 indicates that there's really no chance that the sender is a spammer, or 9 indicates that this is definitely a spammer, maybe 100% or 99% chance. And so depending on the level that you configure, that will determine whether or not it is viewed as spam or not. Now, as far as what happens behind the scenes with sender reputation, well, there is an open proxy test that can be performed. There's hello and hello analysis. And so these are commands that are intended to provide the receiving server with information about the server, the domain, the IP address of the sending server, and so forth. There is reverse DNS lookups. There's SCL ratings analysis of the individual sender's messages. So all of these different things kind of come together in order to determine the sender's reputation and ultimately the SRL. Now, we mentioned that the spam confidence level gets attached to the message itself, and so depending on the level and the spam confidence level actions that you define, you might have an action taken like deleting the message. So let's say you have a spam confidence level that says, if the message is a 9, we want it deleted. So no questions asked, the message would be deleted. Now, let's say it's not a 9. Let's say you have the message, it comes in as an 8 so it won't be deleted. You can establish a reject message if the message is lower than the 9. And in that case, the message will be rejected and an NDR will be sent to the original sender of the message. Now, what if it comes in and it's not an 8, instead it's a 7 as far as it's SCL? Well, in that case, you might establish a quarantine. And so with the quarantine threshold, basically the message will be sent to the quarantine mailbox. And so you configure this so that messages that come in with an SCL of, let's say, a 7, which is still pretty high, but perhaps it's a false positive, you don't want to 
delete or reject false positives. Instead, you would forward them to the quarantine, and then the administrator can see if they're legitimate emails and then can forward them to the recipients. Now, what happens if it's not quite as high as quarantine even, so it's not being deleted, rejected, or quarantined, but it's still higher than you would like? Well, you can establish an SCL junk email threshold, and in this case, if it comes in and it's, let's say, a 6, not high enough to be quarantined, then the message will be sent to the user's junk email folder. And, of course, if the value is lower than the SCL junk email folder threshold, then the email gets delivered. So, okay, so this is uh, interesting because as SCL levels are attached, depending on the number that's applied to it, the SCL number that's applied based upon content filtering and the other anti-spam agents that come before content filtering, so as it applies this number, if your email actually doesn't have a high enough number, it just goes through. So anti-spam is certainly valuable. It's certainly something that you want to make sure is enabled on your systems. If not the exchange built-in anti-spam, then certainly you want to make sure that you have some kind of anti-spam solution, whether it's in the cloud or an appliance in your perimeter, something that is protecting your environment. Now, it's important to remember that there are commandlets that you have to know if you're going to configure the anti-spam settings. We're going to work through a demonstration of this, but it's hard to remember commandlets just by watching them done in PowerShell one time. So you're not going to really be able to memorize them this way. So here are a few commandlets to remember. If you want to view all the agents that are installed on the mailbox server, you can use the get-transport agent, and we're going to use this one in a moment. If you want to take a look at the safe list aggregation, you can use update dash safe list. For content filtering, if you want to configure content filtering, you can use the set dash content filter config. And you can use the dash quarantine mailbox to establish that quarantine mailbox. Now, we're just looking at a few here. Again, we're going to be using quite a few different commandlets in the demonstration to follow. However, for a list of all of the different commandlets and the various parameters, there is a link at the end of this lesson in the additional resources that will take you to a TechNet page that shows you all of the different anti-spam commandlets that you can use to configure the anti-spam agents. With regard to the Exchange 2013 certification exam, the 70-341 exam, it is essential that you know that you have to use PowerShell in order to configure anti-spam agents it's also important for you to know some of those commandlets. So at least peruse the list and try to remember some of these different points so that you have those commandlets in mind should they come up from an exam perspective. Obviously in the real world when you're configuring anti-spam and you need to remember the agent the one time that you're going to do this or maybe the two times you do it in a three-year period well guess what you're going to look it up through TechNet and find the commandlet that you need. But for the sake of studying for the exam topics, do a good job when it comes to memorizing some of the different commandlets. Not just when it comes to anti-spam agents, but other commandlets that you utilize to configure Exchange 2013. All right, so let's jump over to our server and let's take a look at how we would configure our Exchange environment with our mailbox server in order to ensure that we have the various anti-spam agents installed as well as configured to provide for a modicum of safety from spam. All right, so here we are on our Windows Server 2012 system. We're actually on the mailbox server role, and that's because we're going to enable the anti-spam agents on this system. So to do that, we're actually going to go through the Exchange Management shell. We go to the Start menu, scroll over, and here's the Exchange Management shell. And let's just shrink up the screen a little bit, make it easier to see, and clear screen. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to install the anti-spam agents. Now the script for this is actually located if we just go to our computer, 
to program files to Microsoft Exchange Server v15 you can see there's a scripts folder right here and so if we scroll down you can see all of the different scripts right in there what we're going to do is we're going to right click with the shift button held down and we're going to copy as path and we'll change our directory to that path alright and that switches us over to the scripts folder and so now that we have that worked out we're going to type in period backslash install dash anti spam agents dot ps1 and we hit enter you'll note that the spam agents have been installed but it says here the agents listed above have been installed please restart the Microsoft Exchange Transport Service for changes to take effect so we'll do that we'll type restart service MS exchange transport and hit enter All right, and so here we can see we've restarted the Exchange Transport Service. We'll clear the screen. And now at this point, what we want to do is we want to just provide some basic anti-spam configuration here. So if we type get transport agent, we can see that we have a variety of different agents there, and we see the anti-spam agents have been installed, so that's a good sign. Alright, so we've installed the agents. What if we do something like set up an IP block list provider? To do that, we type add IP block list provider. We'll give the name, let's go with zenspamhouse.org. All right, so we're going with a real block list provider there, and we're all set. The next part is let's set the sender ID config, and we'll make it so that when a domain is spoofed, it will be deleted. So set sender ID config. spoofed domain action delete next up let's set the sender reputation configuration with blocking enabled set dash sender reputation config dash sender blocking enabled to true can set the block threshold let's make it six and then the sender blocking period we'll set to 36 okay so here again remember sender reputation that's where if an individual uh, meets certain classifications for having a bad reputation based upon a period of time where the server has watched this sender and has now categorized them as one to block that will be the period of time that the sender will be blocked in terms of hours alright so the next thing we can do is set the quarantine threshold and set the quarantine mailbox that's under content filter configuration so we use the set dash content filter config SCL quarantine 
threshold. If we make it 6, then we can set content filter config SEL quarantine enabled true and the quarantine mailbox. With the quarantine mailbox we could set up a specific mailbox for quarantine or in this case just for the sake of ease we'll make it the administrator's mailbox. And we're all good. Alright, so are you starting to get the picture here? If you have worked with anti-spam from the GUI before, then you know how easy it is to do from the GUI. Within the Exchange Management Console, it's a couple of clicks. Well, it's not so easy anymore. And so when you install the anti-spam agents here on the mailbox server, you're going to have to use the commandlets in order to configure the server. Obviously, it takes a little bit of forethought in terms of what settings you want, but once you know what you want, and especially if you can compare back to the GUI in Exchange 2010, you can just look and see, okay, you know what, I need to configure these various elements. You can use the TechNet article that's listed at the end of this lesson that shows you all of the different commandlets for anti-spam and antivirus settings. And so from there, you'll be able to map out the commandlets that you'll need in order to establish all of the configuration settings that typically you would have done through the GUI. No, I'm not saying it's fun. Not at all. In fact, I think it's a real mistake that they've done this this way. So maybe they'll fix this with a service pack in the future, or maybe not. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. In the meantime, you're going to need to use the commandlets to configure anti-spam settings, and you will need to remember some of these in the event you see them on the Microsoft certification exam because you just never know what kind of content will come your way on that exam. All right, so we've talked about anti-spam settings and you understand how it's working here. Let's jump back over to our server and let's talk about the anti-malware settings that are built right into Exchange 2013. So let's talk for a moment about antivirus solutions that are built into Exchange 2013. There are obviously many solutions available to help protect your environment from malware. But within Exchange 2013, for the first time, there is built-in anti-malware. And at the same time, you can also utilize a hosted anti-malware solution that is called Exchange Online Protection. So it's good to know that these are two different options that Microsoft is promoting. Now it's also good to know that you can combine the two, both built-in and Exchange Online Protection. This isn't the case if you're working with a third-party solution. So if you go with a third party, you'll want to disable the built-in anti-malware protection. Now that's if you're actually installing this on the server itself. If you are using some kind of cloud-based filtering solution, then you can still use your on-premise antivirus solution as well. It will simply provide additional protection. So these are your options. You can go with the built-in Exchange 2013 anti-malware solution. You can go with Exchange Online Protection. You can combine the two together. You can go with a third-party solution, whether it's on-premise or cloud-based. And you might also consider a perimeter-based appliance. One thing, however, that's not recommended is for you to use a file-level-based antivirus solution. There's a link provided at the end of this lesson in the additional resources that will explain a little bit further as far as the reasons, but ultimately there's a problem with file level scanning. Ultimately, for your own personal edification here, file level antivirus scanners will scan a file when it's used or at a scheduled interval. And during that time, the file is locked. And so when Exchange Server tries to access that file, if it's being scanned, it's locked. And so that causes an information store failure. Eventually, this causes the file to become corrupted and unusable. So there are a variety of different dynamic files that Exchange Server uses that have to be exempted from file level scanning. And so the article listed at the end of this lesson will help you to see which files need to be exempt from the process. But again, Microsoft does not recommend that you use file level based antivirus. As far as where you find the antivirus features in Exchange 2013, 
They're actually located under the protection features under malware in the Exchange Admin Center. So let's talk for a minute about the built-in antivirus solution for Exchange 2013. For starters, this is a version 1 solution. This is the first time it's being released in Exchange 2013 and really it's a nice option that it's built right in but it's not incredibly robust. For example, there's no quarantine feature. Now you might say, well why would I want to quarantine a virus? If a virus comes in, I want it deleted, I want it removed, but most third-party solutions allow for a little bit more flexibility. And so the quarantine feature is something that allows you to at least scan and see, is this really a virus? Do I really want this to be removed? And make the decision yourself, as opposed to it just being automatically deleted. So okay, it's again, a version one solution will probably see enhancements as time goes by. Now as far as it being enabled, you can enable it through the PowerShell script enable-anti-malware scanning. You can disable it through the disable-anti-malware scanning.ps1 script. It's actually enabled by default if you select the checkbox during the installation to enable it. If you, during the installation, decide you're going with a third-party solution, you don't have to check that checkbox. It will use HTTP port 80 to download definition updates, and it does this hourly by default. If malware is detected, it can delete the message, delete all attachments, and use default or customized alert text. It can notify the administrator and the sender. So it certainly has some level of functionality, but again, no quarantine feature. Let's jump over and let's take a look at the built-in antivirus settings for Exchange 2013. All right, and so here we are on our Windows Server 2012, and this server is actually the client access server. If we open up our Exchange Admin Center, you can see that we're already logged in and we're looking at the protection feature and we're looking at the malware filter. Here again is where I think they could put an anti-spam tab if you enable the anti-spam agents. But I don't want to beat a dead horse. So we're looking at the malware filter and here's the default antivirus policy. Now, if at times you feel during the lessons that I'm moving a little bit too fast, and perhaps you're not getting a good overview of all of the different pieces in play, keep in mind these lessons are really focused on helping folks pass the 70-341 exam, the Exchange 2013 core exam. And what that means is the content is a little bit deeper and doesn't do all of the hand-holding that you might get from one of our administration courses. So if a lot of this seems like it's a little too fast, perhaps a good idea would be to take a step back and watch the Exchange 2013 administration course. In that course, for example, you'll notice that I spend quite a bit more time on how to configure and really administrate the malware filter settings. So we're looking at the malware filter. You can see that there's a default policy and from here we cannot actually create additional policies we can create them through the exchange management shell in our case though we're just going to make some adjustments to the default anti-malware policy so if we just open this up and you probably noted that there is a summary over here on the right hand side of the policy settings so we look there's the name we click settings and again it's a version 1.0 so we're not going to see a lot of settings that we can configure here. There are additional settings we can configure through the Exchange Management Shell. If we look here, we can see that when malware is detected in any attachment, select whether to delete the entire message or delete all message attachments. And so here we can see delete the entire message is selected. We're going to change this to delete all attachments and use custom alert text and so we can type in the custom alert text here okay so a simple alert text here the attachment that was sent with this message was deleted because the system detected it contained malware please contact your administrator for more information and then if we wanted to we can put even more information than this we might indicate a specific person that they should contact and provide a phone number or something along those lines the next thing is the notifications. So if we looked here, we can notify internal senders, we can notify external senders. At this point, neither one is actually happening because the checkbox is not selected. So if we select both of these checkboxes, now these individuals will be notified 
with a canned message that's already been prepared so it will send a message to the sender of the undelivered message if we look down here at the bottom we can see administrator notifications sends a message to the administrator of the undelivered message so we can actually say let's notify administrator about undelivered messages from the internal senders that's always good so that the administrator knows that there's a problem and we can also select to notify administrator about undelivered messages from external senders you may want to know when a message has come in that was not delivered alright and then certainly we could go through and customize the notifications a little bit further in this case we're going to leave that part alone so that's really all that we can configure with the anti-malware policy it's not a lot again it's not a tremendously robust solution but it does assist us in protecting our environment from malware so it's free and we can use this or we might consider exchange online protection and perhaps partner up with a hybrid solution that allows for both to work together to protect our internal environment let's jump back over to our slides and let's talk a little bit more about exchange online protection so let's just talk for a moment about exchange online protection this was formerly known as FOPI or forefront protection for exchange now EOP exchange online protection provides inbound and outbound spam and malware filtering reporting message trace and mail flow configuration now the features include a web-based management console multiple antivirus engines updates to the definitions every two hours email availability and that's through automatic queues uh, so in other words if your on-premise exchange goes down for whatever reason or the connection is lost between the exchange online protection solution and the on-premise exchange the system will actually queue that email and will deliver it when the on-premise comes back online and as mentioned we also have reporting now in order to configure this you point your MX records to the servers directed for exchange online protection and then those will pass mail back to your on-premise exchange so it's really an easy solution to implement it's one that Microsoft is promoting and it works in harmony with your on-premise exchange now you might be thinking well if I already have a built-in antivirus solution that's good enough and maybe in your case it is but if you are concerned about doubling up and having a more robust solution put in place with spam and malware filtering then you might go with exchange online protection again this is completely up to you you have to weigh the costs you can look at other third-party solutions web-based or on-premise you can look at an appliance so there are a ton of different options keep in mind however the exchange certification exam when it comes to questions of this sort they only revolve around Microsoft based solutions so it's good for you to know that even though yes there are third-party options and appliances and so forth typically Microsoft is looking to see that you understand their solutions so remember exchange online protection remember that it works with the built-in antivirus solution that Microsoft has in exchange 2013 those are important points alright so just to bring our scenario back into the discussion with Spytech Prime because we know what their business is we know that they're a little leery they're not going to go with just the built-in exchange antivirus so we would want to enable the anti-spam agents and we know the antivirus was already installed by default when we did the installation and so we would want to configure the anti-spam agents and configure the antivirus solutions at the same time we would recommend in their case that they consider exchange online protection or a third-party all-in-one solution some kind of solution that provides archiving and other parts that they can get with an all-in-one cloud-based solution as a listing for additional research there are several different articles that I thought you might find helpful in understanding anti-spam and antivirus solutions in exchange 2013 so for starters there's the exchange 2013 enable anti-spam and sample config there's anti-spam and anti-malware commandlets from TechNet there's antivirus software in the operating system on exchange servers another good TechNet article 
and then finally disable or bypass anti-malware scanning so if you are going to go with a third-party solution this is an important one and so again that's in TechNet so we hope you found this informative thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson